Well, amen. This morning, we are in a brand new series today, and we are going to be dealing here this morning uh, with 2 Corinthians, and we'll be going through this study through the fall and into next year, Um, but we'll be hitting a lot of these high points here uh, with regard to the Corinthian church, and so 2 Corinthians, I've titled this series, uh, What Difference Does God Make? In other words, uh, how significant is God in our lives when it comes to uh, the life of the disciple of Christ? How is it that he impacts us and how is it that uh, we should be paying attention to God in our lives? And so this is intended to be intensely practical as we journey through 2 Corinthians. So you won't want to miss a week, all right? You'll want to come because there's just so many great passages that we're going to be just uh, nailing the tops of these mountains as we go through this great, great book of Scripture. So this morning, uh, as we stop and we give thought to uh, Corinthians, I think it'll be a a real blessing uh, to you. And there's a lot that goes on. If you know much of the Bible at all, if you've read the New Testament, no doubt you've come across 1st and 2nd Corinthians. 1st Corinthians, as you know, uh, is written, and there's a whole lot of trouble that's going on in this church at Corinth. And by the time you come to chapter 2, it's not that much easier either. There was a lot of things that were going on uh, during this period of time. Let me just give you a little bit of an overview before we really get started. Uh, This morning's message will deal with uh, dealing with pain. But before we get there, let's put this into context just a little bit. The Apostle Paul spent almost three years ministering in Corinth. So he was there uh, and he was church planting. This was not an easy ministry to establish. Because of some political reasons, uh, there was quite... An interesting, shall I say? How how should I put this graciously? There was an interesting group of people in Corinth. Uh, You remember Paul calls out the people that live on the island of Crete. He calls them basically lazy and liars and so forth. And that was really kind of a testament uh, to their character as a whole. But then as people came to Christ, it began to change, and at least in those people's lives. And it trickles down through the community. Same thing needs to happen in Corinth because the people who have come to Corinth are not for the most part upstanding citizens in their own right. They tend to be somewhat uh, drifters, if you get my meaning, uh, with regard to morality and other things. Paul is going to go there uh, and stay there for those three years. Then Paul leaves. He goes to Ephesus, goes to some other places as well, and then back to Ephesus. Uh, Later, while he is there, Paul receives news. And the news comes from Chloe, and she talks about the factions that are in Corinth. Now, (laughs) Corinth is a very divided group of Christians. Uh, evidently Apollos had gone and visited there. Evidently Peter himself had gone and visited there. And so they were not uh, without the opportunity to hear some uh, great orators and be around some godly people. Uh, When it comes to the Apostle Paul, though, he is uh, kind of uh, an enemy of theirs at times because he is pointing out their sin. Now, how many of us here like it when someone points out our sin? Yeah, we just gravitate to that person, don't we? We, we? we should have respect for those people, but usually we push them away. And uh, we don't want people looking into our lives and saying, listen, this is not in line with God's word. He hears all of these things that are going on, and the Bible says that he's going to bring a letter and concerns from Corinth. Uh, so he's writing 1 Corinthians as a response to Stephanus. Uh, and there was a whole bunch of questions. Stephanus wanted to, you know, he wanted to talk about sexual immorality. Uh, he wanted to, remember 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we have a case of incest that's going on and everybody knows it in the church. Uh, they also had questions about meat offered to idols. What do we do? I mean, is it all right for us to eat a, a steak that was offered to the goddess Diana or whatever it is? So Paul writes 1 Corinthians. 55 AD, Paul visits a second time and he describes that as painful. Paul then returns back to Ephesus, and this is where he is when he goes through a very tumultuous time. We'll talk about that a little bit later here this morning. Uh, But it's during that period of time 
that Paul writes to Corinth. We don't have this letter, but it's referenced or alluded to as the severe letter. So you can only rem- <laughs> just imagine what kind of uh, uh, straight talk there was in that letter. But he must have been really you know, in response to the painful visit that he had there, dealing with the people, trying to convince them that they needed to walk in a godly way. He was getting so much pushback, and he finally goes, and he visits, and it's a rough time. Then he goes through, and we find uh, Paul is in Macedonia. He's reunited with uh, Titus and, and also Timothy during this period of time, and it's during this period of time in 55 that he is going to write the book that we're studying, this letter, back to the Corinthians. After a bit, he'd go back to Corinth for three months, and then he goes on to Jerusalem after that, and while he's uh, there, he's going to write the book of Romans. Later in that same year, he's going to take off for Jerusalem. So what we have before us is an opportunity to understand uh, what is going on here. Uh, what is really happening with, with the Apostle Paul? I want you to notice here in chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians, where the Bible says to us, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Acacia. Grace to you and peace from our God and our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very typical introduction in a letter. But he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning, shall we? God, we come to you this morning thankful for the revelation that you have provided for us. There are so many practical applications, Lord, from your word. And I pray, Father, this morning that as we journey through 2 Corinthians, our hearts would be drawn to these practical applications. That, Father, we would understand what you are conveying to disciples in the past and disciples in the present and those who will be disciples in the future. Help us, Lord, to draw from our morning passage today the things that will help us in dealing with afflictions. Help us, Father, for we know that we live in a time of affliction. In fact, all of us have always lived in a time of affliction. and So we need comfort as only you can provide. So bring it to our hearts this morning, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This morning we're talking about a topic here that is very significant and it's no doubt uh, one of the, the main things that we like to think about when we think about our relationship with God. We think about the role that God plays as we deal with pain in our lives. As we know, God is a God who's rich in mercy. In fact, the Apostle Paul would call him the father of mercies. You see that there in that passage. That was actually a terminology that was used very commonly in synagogues in the day. Father of mercies, God of comforts. Literally, God is one who comes alongside of us who find ourselves suffering. The word comfort there is God is a God of of comfort is perichalesis. It means to bring encouragement or consolation. Now it's amazing to me that the church at Corinth would actually criticize the Apostle Paul because of all of the difficulties that the man went through. You remember that whole list of, of, of things that the Apostle Paul endured? I've been in shipwrecks, I've been by snakes, I've been, you know, uh, stoned to death. I mean, all of these different things. It's like, he lists them just like they're like just normal stuff that happens during the day. You know, it's like he goes through all of these terrible afflictions. Now, the Corinthians looked at that and they said, well, obviously you're not being blessed by God. Obviously, there's a, a problem in your life. There must be some reason for all of this suffering. And so so why do you come to us and scold us uh, for the temple prostitutes that we enjoy? Why do you come to us and criticize our morality, criticize our faith, criticize our 
You get the idea. And so the Apostle Paul finds himself having to defend before this group the afflictions that he is experiencing. And so here we are, we come to this passage of Scripture, and this passage of Scripture is very interesting because this is really the first thing Paul has to do in gaining a fair audience with the Corinthians. Why? Because they need to understand how these afflictions have come into Paul's life, why God has allowed them. And so now, after this passage is done, by the time we come to chapter 2 next week, we can actually start to get to the meat of the order. Do you know what I mean? We start to get to the message that Paul wants to convey. But the reason, again, why we're dealing with afflictions first is because of their misunderstanding of these afflictions that come into our lives. You and I need to know and understand that we depend on the Father of mercies and the God of comfort every day. I want to take you to the first point this morning. The first point is the abundance of afflictions. And we would say that it is a reality for all people. Matthew Henry, the great writer of the commentary, uh, Matthew Henry's commentary, says the Lord gets his best soldiers out of the highlands of affliction. Extraordinary afflictions are not always the punishment of extraordinary sins, but sometimes the trial of extraordinary graces. Sanctified afflictions are spiritual promotions, he said. You see, all the things that Paul was going through were not in a reaction by God for sin in the Apostle Paul's life. You see, these afflictions were actually being used to shape him and mold him and make him the person that God wanted him to be. Oswald Chambers says the agony of man's affliction is often necessary to put him into the right mood to face the fundamental things of life. The psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now, after my afflictions, I have kept thy word. Now, Paul is going to write this, and he's going to say that these afflictions are normative. Notice here in our passage of Scripture uh, that the Bible says in verse 4 there, it is God, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. Now, we all have afflictions. Is there anyone here who doesn't have afflictions? We all have afflictions, don't we? Uh, the idea of this uh, word, afflictions, uh, is literally, um, it means to feel pressure inwardly resulting from outward circumstances, oftentimes associated in the Christian context with, with challenges in ministry and service for Christ. It's living the Christian life. It's some of the difficulties that come from that. But I want you to think of this term afflictions as pressure that's being pushed upon your life. And don't we live in a time of afflictions? But haven't we always? Haven't we always? What was the first book in the Bible that was ever written, time-wise, on the timeline? Job, that's right. And it's all about man's afflictions. I had a phone call this week. It was my best friend. He was crying on the phone when he called me. I know that's not good. He said there was a boy in his youth group who committed his suicide this past week. Now, the sad thing about this is his father had committed suicide less than a year before. And I believe his wife works as a church secretary. Very involved in the church. Shook the church, shakes the church. I'm sure this morning there's a, a lot of turmoil in that body of Christ there. Afflictions. We all have them. We're feeling that pressure at times of our life. And this is not an easy point to make. The Apostle Paul would say that he was pressured, that he felt this as well. This picture here just shows you a ship. You know, sometimes these ships will go through the Cape Cod Canal where, where I grew up, and, and oftentimes it's almost 100 feet from the water line all the way up to the top of the, the, the very top of the mass of the ship, you know, where the smokestack is as they journey through there. But it is amazing to see these ships when they're fully loaded down, uh, pass through the canal. 
uh, they go through the canal and it seems like there's hardly any freeboard the distance from the water to the gunnel the, the, the edge of the rail as you would uh, for those land lovers but uh, we would understand that this is a ship that is weighted down this is the image that Paul has in fact this word for afflictions was actually used in maritime speech for a ship that was weighed down have you ever felt like you've been weighed down uh, that there's pressure that's, that's forced upon you, that, that's pushing down on you. Well, Paul is going to write about the pressure that he is dealing with. Notice there in verse 8 uh, where Paul says, uh, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively. You see, Paul even went through these afflictions. He, he went through all of these afflictions. This was a, a really rough time in the Apostle Paul's life. Most people believe that the difficulty that Paul has in Asia is related to Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, Paul deals with Demetrius the silversmith, and he finds himself uh, the, the, really the, the bullseye of this silversmith. You see, this silversmith, as it turns out, was making gods, false idols, out of silver that people would buy uh, for this female deity that they worshipped in the city of Ephesus. And as Christianity began to come into Ephesus and the church started Started to grow people said hey I don't need this this silver God anymore what would you do if you had a silver idol on your mantelpiece and you came to Jesus what would you do with it melt it down I would definitely melt it down and if silver was high enough I'd cash it in thank you very much you see it began to really change things. And the people there who were losing their livelihood got all excited about this. And they accused Paul and the church leaders there of, of actually uh, turning their nose on this deity. And, and the Bible says in Acts 19 that the whole city was filled with confusion. It, it began to erupt. And it begins to erupt with violence. Apostle Paul says in chapter 19 that he wants to go and be with these people and address the crowds, these mad crowds. And the Bible says that his compadres there would not even let him go out the door. They said, no, you're going to stay here. And some of the, the leaders were dragged off before the, the magistrates in the city and eventually it calmed down. That could be what Paul is talking about there. Paul talks about being drugged before the, the wild beasts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, If from, from human motives I fought with wild beasts in Ephesus, I'm not sure that he's speaking there of a literal hand-to-hand -hand combat with lions and tigers and bears. I think what he was dealing with is he's talking about something and it's figurative. He's dealing with something that was like that. It was so tumultuous that in his heart he felt this tremendous weight and this affliction was great because he realized that at the very stake of it all were the hearts and lives of individuals and what was at stake beyond that was the spread of the gospel. You see, Cor Corinth was a very pivotal city. It was a city on the seashore and it was a city where there was tremendous trade oftentimes the apostle paul would go to a city like that because as the people came to christ they would take the gospel around the world and it was a natural way to spread the good news of christ it makes sense doesn't it great strategy and god did that all the time it's no wonder that satan focused on corinth and he wanted to do everything in his power to destroy the testimony of faith in that city. So Paul says that he is dealing with afflictions, but he's dealing with afflictions in Ephesus that are due to his faith in Christ. Notice what Paul says here. He goes on and he begins to describe the affliction and its effect upon him. He says, we were burdened excessively. He says, beyond our strength. There was nothing that he could find in himself that would produce what he needed to get by. You see, he was in a time of desperation. He said, we despaired even of life itself. Indeed, he said, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves but in God. Have you ever gotten to the point where you felt like the sentence of death 
was in yourself, that you despaired even of life. The idea of having the sentence of death upon yourself is having, like go back to the person who was declared guilty in a court of law and then sentenced to death. I can't even imagine what it'd be like to be standing there and to hear the judge say, life in prison or death by such and such and then sit on death row waiting for that moment to come. That's how Paul describes himself. He despairs of life. He has, he's like a man who has a death sentence upon him. This is the depth of the affliction that he has gone through. Have you ever found yourself in such a situation? I hope you've never felt that way. But some have. Some have. Some have been so discouraged that you despaired of life. I know for me personally, I have had that experience. As I read these words, I can identify with them. I remember sitting in the hospital fully exhausted, just despairing of life, praying that God would bring someone to come and visit me. God, would you just bring someone through that door? So discouraged times in ministry when it's just put you on overload and you just despair to the point of what use is it? Trying to advance the cause of Christ and finding resistance, no, finding spiritual warfare and getting to the place where you're so discouraged. Well, I've got news for us. When we find ourselves in that place, what we need and what we have is the God of all comfort. You see, God says that his comfort comes from the comforted. Now, Paul is going to go on. He's going to say that he's delivered. We'll get there in just a moment. But I want you to look up there in verse 4. The Bible says that God, who is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, comforts us in our affliction. So that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort to which we ourselves are comforted by God. You see, God has a plan. You and I go through these difficulties. And you notice there in verse 4 those two words. I want you to see those two words. If you have your Bibles, you ought to get a highlighter. You know what I mean? My whole Bible is full of highlighters. And every color means something. See, that's, that's my notes up here. Every single color means something helps see those two words so that it's giving us the reason he says that the god of all comfort who comforts us in our affliction so that whenever you're reading god's word whenever you're studying god's word and you see those two words so that pay attention because he's telling us this is the reason for this the god of all comfort is going to comfort you he's going to come to you he is going to bring deliverance to you but here's the reason for it the reason for it is so that you will be able to go and comfort others who are experiencing the similar trial I remember as a young person praying for people who are going through cancer treatment. And I'd heard about chemotherapy. I'm not young, folks. I'm, I mean, at, when this happens, I'm not young. This, this is back 2003, so 14 years ago. Ooh, I'll be 60 this month, yuck. I'm 46 years old. And we'd pray for people. Yeah, they're going through chemotherapy. And when I walked through the door into the wing of the hospital with my wife for her chemotherapy, I finally understood what the chemotherapy was all about. I had no idea what it was. I mean, like, no idea. And then I found out. And as we went back for the visits every three weeks, I began to know and understand a lot about what people go through with chemotherapy. 
when Job's three friends tried to give him advice, they were way off the mark because they'd never gone through that themselves. They'd never lost anything. They, they didn't have children that they'd buried. They didn't experience the, the pain that he was suffering with, with regard to the boils on his flesh. They didn't understand any of those things, but they were there with their mouth to give him advice. You and I need to learn from that. Because far too often I've gotten advice from well-meaning brothers and sisters in Christ that was so far off that it caused a burden to my soul. Sometimes it just plain out and out made me angry. If God has permitted you to be comforted at his hand, you have a role in comforting others. Don't leave it to, understand how I say this, don't leave it to a well-meaning fool. You see, what ends up happening so often is you and I go through these difficulties and we come out and we feel like we're, we're we just one survivor. You know what I mean? We sometimes become bitter. We become shellish. We put a shell around ourselves. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to deal with it. Nothing. But that is not at all what God says we should do as we've gone through this affliction. We're supposed to use the affliction, according to God's word, to comfort others who are going through a similar affliction. Understand this, going back from Job, going to tomorrow and the day after, there will always be people that are afflicted, and there will always be opportunities for us at the right point in time when we can minister the graces of God. When we can show someone that God is the father of mercies, that God is the God of all comforts, the application comes from those who have been comforted. The third point this morning is that anticipation of deliverance is a known reality. And this helps me today. It truly does. It helps me today because I recognize that our God is a God who's a deliverer. Notice with me there in verse 8, would you? When Paul says, we do not want you to be unaware of our affliction, we are burdened excessively and so forth, he gets on down there and he says, indeed we have the sentence of death within ourselves so that, here's the purpose of having that sentence of death. God put it in his life so that he would not trust in himself, but rather turn because there was nowhere else to go but to God. You see how that was all engineered by God? Sometimes God brings us down so low that we recognize we cannot pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It is absolutely impossible that what we need is God himself. And Paul says it is God who, what? Raises the dead. Are you good with your English? That is a what tense? Present tense. Our God is a God who raises the dead, not just looking back and say, oh, God raised the dead. My friend, God raises the dead. That's why I will not get cremated, because I look forward to the day when the trumpet blows and my body comes ripping out of that ground, and there's a glorified body on my way up to heaven that I'll receive. Amen? Whoo! I am looking forward to that day. No, let me just phrase it this way. My body's looking forward to that day. And so bury me in a nice casket in a hole in the ground and I'm just going to be waiting for that moment when the resurrection takes place. And my friends, listen, the Bible says that it is going to take place. Notice what Paul says. He says here in verse 9, Indeed, we have the sentence of death, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us. Here's our English lesson for this morning. Verse 10 says, he delivered us. That's what tense? Past tense. He delivered us from so great a peril of death. God lifted the sentence of death that was on the heart of the Apostle Paul. And the Bible says he will deliver us. That is what? That is an immediate future. And it's speaking of the fact that God will deliver us in the future if we need it tomorrow. So I've been delivered And if I need it tomorrow, the God of all comfort is there for me. And if that's not enough, it says here that he will deliver us. That is yet future. He on whom we have set our hope, he will yet deliver us 
you also joining and helping us. And so the Apostle Paul looks at this and he says, our God is a deliverer. Our God is a God of all comfort. Our God is going to be there. He's going to lift us out of that miry clay, as it were. And he's going to give us the strength spiritually that we need to get through these difficulties. If you're going through a hard time today, know this. That the God of all comfort is here for you today. He'll be here for me tomorrow. And ultimately, because I know that my body is either going to get raptured or it's going to die. But my God is there for that too. Paul looked at it and he said, hey, if it's over for me, if there's no earthly deliverance, I want you to think of uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. I want you to think of all the, all the people who have died for Jesus Christ and their testimony of Christ. There have been people by the thousands upon thousands who were martyred, uh, celebrating 500 years of the Reformation this October. Both the Lutherans and the Catholics put to death tens of thousands of followers of Jesus Christ. You know that? Where was God when that person was led to the fire and burnt alive? Where was God? Well, you see, I believe in dying grace. How is it that these people in the fire were able to sing praises to God until God took their soul at the end of it all rest in this there is victory for those of us who are in jesus christ amen there is victory because we are going to be resurrected god is the god who raises the dead god is not done with us and even if my life is given for faith in christ so be it i still know that there lies ahead for me and every single one of us who are followers of jesus christ the brightest of futures hallelujah hallelujah our suffering here is but for a moment and God brings it to our heart and he gives us the strength to know that there is a permanent deliverance that is yet ahead. I leave you this morning with two key points of action. One is, you and I need to remember that God is comforting us so that we will comfort others. Will you be that comforter? Will you stand up and encourage brothers and sisters in Christ, who are experiencing what you experienced, where you can speak to the issue. This is how God moved in my heart to deliver me. This is what I learned from God. This is how God helped me. You know, when someone goes through an experience that, that is so burdensome, you gain wisdom, you gain from God, and you're able to speak to the issue as others cannot point of action. Use your sufferings, use your afflictions to encourage others. And then second of all, he tells us here something at the end of this passage that I want you to remember. He says, you also, God will yet deliver us. God has delivered us. God is delivering us. Three basically ten tenses there. But Paul points to the people in Corinth and he says, you also joining and helping us through your prayers. So that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. You who are helping us through your prayers. You and I are called upon to pray for those who need deliverance. And prayer, according to this passage of scripture, makes a difference. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, it truly makes a difference. You can pray for someone who's going through an affliction that God will give them grace and strength and deliver them. And God hears that prayer. And it's powerful. It's powerful. Paul looked at his afflictions and he said, because of the prayers of many, I was able to get through that. How faithful are you in praying for those who are going through affliction? especially those who are fighting the fight, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. 
It might be that we're taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to those right here in this town or across the world. But there are afflictions that come. The church must lift up its voice and pray, realizing that prayer makes a significant, significant difference. If you're here this morning, let me encourage you to stop and think. Stop and think about your relationship with God. Stop and think about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Have you placed faith in Jesus Christ? God, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, wants you to have a relationship with him in Jesus Christ. Let's stand and bow our heads, shall we? It may be this morning that you're not sure about where you'll spend your eternity. I encourage you not to leave here today until you know that answer. And that answer can be had by personal faith in Jesus Christ. And maybe God is raising up from our midst an army of those who would be comforters. Those who would take the opportunities to be an encourager to those who are going through life's afflictions. Father in heaven, we thank you for your many blessings to us. Help us, Lord, to be useful to you. Help us, so, Lord, I pray, to give you the glory that you deserve by being comforters to those who are afflicted. Father, I pray your blessing now on anyone here who's not sure about where they'll spend their eternity. May they this morning place their faith in Jesus Christ and know the certainty of salvation through faith. Thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be seated, please, for just a moment? A couple of announcements this morning. I know you thought you were going to get out of here without announcements, right? <laughs> Never happens. But just a couple of announcements this morning as you're going out today. Uh, we start off, because this is October 1st, uh, with the Operation Christmas Child. And uh, Operation Christmas Child, if you're not too familiar with it, uh, there are opportunities to place into a shoebox toys for children, different things that would excite someone around the world who doesn't have the opportunity to get gifts or presents. Now this in itself would be a very nice gesture if that's what it was all about. But it goes one step further. Samaritan's Purse will put in every single box the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to get involved and bless those who are around the world. And the gospel of Jesus Christ traveling with that gift has led to the, uh, the uh, salvation of many children and their families. And so this is a wonderful opportunity. So as you came in this morning, you might have known that there were about 600 boxes out there in the foyer. And what we want you to do is to pick up those boxes, as many as you'd like to pack, and then you'll be bringing them back here in November as we assemble them all. They'll go from here in a truck down to Bowie, where there's a church that'll be collecting them from all the other churches. From there, they go to Baltimore into the big shipping center there, where they're packed into great big boxes. And from there, they go to the, the, the container ships and so forth, or planes and head around the world to all of these gospel, or all of these places that need the gospel. Now it's important for us to remember how to pack these boxes. And so I wanna show you just a quick video uh, of a couple of minutes. This guy in this video really knows his stuff. He really does, and he can tell you better than me. So let's just roll that video. Here you milk go. Milk goes great with a glass of milk. Packing an Operation Christmas Drought Jew box. Okay, let's be honest. Packing an Operation Christmas Child shoebox can go great with anything. It's so that other kids can learn about Jesus. Praise the Lord. Oh, and it's also a great way to teach your own kids about giving. Teach your kids about giving. giving. Have a great day. Oh, and don't forget, make good choices. So basically, you get an empty box, which any box will work. Really? Okay, not any box. Much better. Okay, so now you have your empty box. Now you can pick the age range, and if you want it to be for a boy or a girl. Okay, come on, please be a boy. Please be a boy. Well, 
looks like we're gonna be packing for a boy this year. First, you can choose a wow item, such as a soccer ball or a stuffed animal. Mm. And you can choose other fun toys, too. Hygiene items. Oh, and school supplies. There are, of course, some items you cannot pack. Like liquids. Food. Items related to war. Live animals. And don't even think about packing chocolate, because it melts. No candy and no toothpaste. When your gift is finished, you can write a letter and include a photo. It gives it a nice personal touch. When your box is done, you can make your shipping donation online through Follow Your Box. Simply print off your tracking label to see where the destination of your gift will be. And don't forget, it's important to pray for the child that is receiving this gift. Because packing a box is a simple way to share the gospel with kids all around the world. Maybe even in... Nib... In Africa. Now that your box is done, it's time to get moving. Transport your box to a nearby drop-off location near you. These will be open all across the U.S. on National Collection Week, the third week in November. Drop it off and voila, you pack the shoebox. Easy as one, two, three. So he's much more colorful than me. So uh, if you would like to purchase at discounted items out there, we've bought some things in bulk. There's soccer balls out there and so forth that you can buy today. Take them home. We don't want them here at the church anymore. Uh, get them in your box. And, uh, and don't forget, there's $9 that needs to accompany every single box. Oftentimes, uh, it brings the cost to a, of a box from somewhere to 15 to $30, so uh, depending on what all you want to put in it. But you get the message, uh, and uh, people will be out there at the table. They can answer more of your questions there. Starting this morning, uh, first Sunday of every month when we have communion, uh, we are going to have uh, special envelopes out there by our giving boxes. And so on your way out where you put your offering, uh, there's a special offering envelope there. That's for the benevolent fund. And that goes to people who have needs uh, within the community or within our own church. And so if you put money in that in form of check or cash, uh, that's where that is designated to go. If you're a gentleman, you're here this morning, you want to be involved in our men's ministry, it starts tomorrow night, at series 33. There's a sign-up sheet out there on the left side when you go out the double doors, and uh, we'd love to have you come and be a part of that. And then there's also a newcomer's luncheon coming up October the 8th. So I think most of the information is there in your bulletin. So check it all out and uh, be a part of what you can be a part of, all right? Let's stand and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, help us, Lord, as we go from this place to take our mission seriously. And help us, Father, to bless those who we come across in this coming week. May we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to ears and hearts. And, Father, may we also carry your comfort to those who are going through difficult times. Bless your church, I pray now in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.